OK, if I may interrupt your good discussion. I hate doing that. But um, we, we'd love to have a little open mic now. Uh, Tessa has a mic. So it's important that you speak into the mic so everybody can hear it. But we'd love your response um, on any things that we talked about, questions, comments, further elaboration. So this is your time to interact, OK? So I'd love someone to be the first one to be brave and grab the mic and uh, start in. Tessa has the mic. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for being the pace setter. Yeah, we'll see how this goes. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I've noticed a lot in the movement of empowering work and workers. Uh, I have a fear that there's an over-empowerment to the point of your work alone matters. Okay. Uh, and nothing else is required or needed. Uh, what are things that you've put into place when you talk with people or work with people to help work and worship come together and uh, primarily mission? Yeah, that's a really good question. And again, uh, it's always an important stewardship not to overcorrect on one side or to be reductionistic on the other side. So you can have an impoverished situation where you overcorrect and uh, do not have a good integral approach. So I think your question is a really important one. It's always an important uh, reminder. And so uh, I think several things uh, are important there is that there's no way that we want to diminish uh, the clergy callings or missionary callings. Um, we talk a lot about, in our particular context, what's at stake in this uh, issue. And one of the things that's at stake is the lack of proclamation of the gospel, that evangelism can be diminished. But I want to say that if it's thought through carefully, it's actually heightened. And there's all kinds of reasons why. So we do, yes, you're right. We don't want to communicate. We don't want to overcorrect a needed correction. That's a stewardship thing, which is well said. Uh, it needs to be driven by theological conviction. and if. You are committed to teach the scripture from Genesis to Revelation to have what we call narrative or canonical coherence, then you are not going to overemphasize work because work is everywhere. So I mean, different aspects of work, the difficulty, the meaningless, the struggle from Ecclesiastes. If you teach the scriptures regularly through all of scripture in your church or context, you will hit a good balance. I'm just saying because it's, it's woven through the whole tapestry. But you, obviously, it's very important that we don't uh, make work an idol. Uh, so I think what helps, David Miller's work, early work on God at Work, he's uh, now at Princeton, he was at Yale, does a really good job of, of des describing the faith at work movement in different areas. So there needs to be a good comprehensive approach that there's an evangelism emphasis, there's certainly a justice emphasis, there's an emphasis of work itself being intrinsically valuable as well as altruistic or having utilitarian value. So I think you're exactly right. Uh, the current status for most, not all, but most is to have a very impoverished understanding of their work. Most, I would say, at least in my experience, across tribes have a very bifurcated, plutonic kind of dualistic view of the world. Here's temporal, here's eternal, here's sacred, here's secular. So I'm just saying we have work to do, but we don't want to overcorrect. So I hear you, and I think what will help us not in a, in a movement overcorrect is if we really have a good understanding of scripture from creation to consummation. We teach the whole counsel of God, we will have, I don't like the word balance, but we will have a good rhythm. But it's right, I mean, we're not, the danger of anything is like, oh, now I need to overcorrect and work becomes the all end of all end. But I don't want to minimize, because when you look at scripture, work is so central. Uh, faithfulness, not only faithfulness, I would say, sir, but also fruitfulness. We, we have really misunderstood we think faithfulness is all that matters. In the biblical text, is a faithful life is a fruitful life. Productivity and fruitfulness really matter in Scripture. So, yeah, I, I think we always want to be careful of that. I think another reason is a, a number of gifts and people who speak into a context help bring balance. But it's a very good question. But I think if we stay tethered to the biblical, tethered to the biblical text and follow it through without forcing it, we will see how important work is and we will have a good balance and we won't overcorrect. But that's always a good reminder. And we're not minimizing the importance of the proclamation of the gospel. Quite the opposite, because work gives you plausibility of the gospel, because so much of the gospel is seen and not just heard. So good, good question, and I take that that's important for all of us. Um, and that's always true in any kind of movement or emphasis. When we find ourselves in an impoverished situation that's underemphasized, we can overemphasize it. Good word. Yeah. Uh, yeah, at our table we talked about 1 Corinthians 10.31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God, and how 
an HR manager at our table said, how do I teach my people that whatever they do is worship? Um, it can be worship, it can or be. it can be idolatry. It, it's one or the other. So right. how do you talk about that? Well, what I would, I mean, you've already highlighted a New Testament text, but I would start in Genesis. I mean, par, part of this idea, when we separate work and worship in our mind, my, my wife has a fun conversation with children, right? In our early development stage at our church, she'll ask them, what, is, what do your mommy, mommy and daddy do on Sunday? And right away they say, worship. And she'll say, when your daddy or mommy goes to uh, the office on Monday, what do they do? They go, work. Okay, it's not bad. And then she'll say, does your mommy and daddy, do your mommy and daddy worship on Sunday or Monday? No. See, the language matters. So I'm just saying, the framework of worship for early children all the way on, we train them with language and prayers that worship is the gathered church and work is the scattered church. So I would say, I go back to that rich theology. If people have their nose in the text, they're beginning to see, wow, this separation between Sunday and Monday, this separation of my mind between, this is my work world and this is my worship, this compartmentalization is not God's design. And then I would say also, when they have a rich Christology of who Jesus is and what he came to do, it begins to go, wow, what does it mean that Jesus' presence of the Spirit is with me in my work, informing me? And what does it mean that Jesus made great tables? Um, so, I mean, those are things where I think people begin to reshape their imagination of the importance of that. But it is really there in Scripture. It's not forced. So it's helping them see Scripture and living into that story. And one example, another example too, is that many of us speak, teach the ministries of the Holy Spirit in a very reductionistic way. Um, and the fruit of the Spirit, remember the first time someone is filled with the Holy Spirit? In the Bible, is to do work. So it's focused on Monday, not Sunday. So I, I'm just saying, people think about what does it mean to form people? What does it mean how work forms you? What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? That language Paul had in mind was much more than on a Sunday or even among the, the ecclesia, the body. It was what they did every day. So it's, it's beginning to see what the Scripture teaches and help people align their life more with that, that story. So it's a good point. It's just all over there, and it's re helping them rethink from cradle to grave. It's got to start young in our programming. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you said language matters and some other words that... Uh... Yes. That we also hear. I, I just want to see how you, can you connect these words to, to this vision. Uh, purpose, job, calling, vocation, and retirement. Yeah, those are all really good. Um, and I would say vocation, uh, in a sense, is a broader sense that we are called to someone. I'll, I'll commend Oz Guinness's book, The Call. I think he does the best on this. We are called to someone, but we're all called, called to do something as well. So vocation is a broader term of what it means to be uh, made in God's image. Remember, Salem, this idea image, uh, John Kilner's book, Destiny and Dignity, is the best book out on, on this word image bearing. I mean, the image bearing is at the heart of any kind of Christian anthropology. And you have connection and reflection. So vocation is both. It's both our calling to someone and call to do something. Uh, some people call the Puritans call it primary and secondary calling. So I mean that idea, they are closely related but they're not fully related. I would say in, uh, you know, job, if you follow its etymology, you, know, you think about a bank job, you know, it has some negative connotations because work is hard. It's fallen. Work is not Pollyanna. And this is why Ecclesiastes says it drives me crazy and it me gives me meaning. You know, work is both. It's good, bad, and ugly. But a job usually is tied to compensation. That's what I would say in most common English, uh, rather than just contribution. Or work uh, and calling and vocation are not necessarily tied to compensation. Um, purpose, me, what else did you get on there? Purpose. Yeah, retirement, you know, that, that is an interesting idea. And um, I use the word refocusing. I'm trying to change some of that. But it's part of an American uh, cultural conversation the idea of retirement is challenging in terms of how Americans have framed it. And so we want to be charitable. Um, you don't have to have a paycheck all your life, but you're still called to contribute. Uh, and I have a challenge. Uh, I'm not there yet, but I have a real challenge with biblical Christians or people who hold to a Christian worldview that 
as they say, make all they can, save all they can, and then sit on their can. <laughs> right? I'm not being uncharitable. There's nothing wrong with making all you can. Uh, economics matter. Prosperity in a good way, not, not in a wrong, distorted way, matters. I mean, economics matter. Um, so I'm not, I'm not anti that. I'm just saying that there's a danger that is very unbiblical to sit. It's like the rich fool in the parable, right? that Jesus talks about, he had bigger and bigger barns and God was out of the picture, it was all about him. He was gonna eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we may die and the Lord says, okay, I'm done, you're done, you're out of here, pal. But I, but I think there's always a danger, again, of this uh, dream of leisure only, self-absorption, rather than giving your life away for others. So, um, if I probably missed some more things there, but retirement, I think as Christians we should, it's not that the word is bad, we understand what that means. Usually it means I'm not getting paid for my work anymore, but work continues. Significant work in relationships, intimacy, and contribution in the world. In fact, some of the greatest contribution I think is when we're older, if we're vibrant. So, yeah, I'd love to change that word actually in uh, American parlance, but I don't know if we're gonna be able to change it. I, I say, you know, how are you refocusing today? Mm -hmm. What's your new chapter of your life in a story narrative? Yeah. Tom, I've taken a couple of the classes, online classes provided by Made to Flourish. Have you, like a webinar yeah. or something? Yeah, Wonderful. one that you did recently and one that another gentleman did. You here. survived it. I did, Okay. yes, Good. And, and here to tell about it. Good. Uh, and so I've greatly appreciated the way that you are opening my eyes and mind to the role of work in who we are as men and women bearing the image of God. Yes. However, I was on the University of Kansas campus as a crusader just after you left there. Well, really? And so I was I at KU, too. So well, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. You had just left, and I was there as a... Did I just leave a terrible mess for you? No. But... You sorry. Know, I'm so if, sorry. If, if we're, you know, because I love the emphasis of those parachurch campus ministries where it's on discipleship sure. and sure. evangelism and relationship yeah. building. Yeah. And I'm still just trying to see and understand because I appreciate David Platt and Francis Chan and all sure. of these leaders who are saying, get back to the mission, truth infused relationships of living out the Christ yeah. life with others. And I'm just back to Alex's question, I think a little yeah. bit is, how do we see the integration of that truth infused relationship in the workplace? Yeah, and let me just, uh, you know, it is, it is integration. So let me, without going too long, yesterday, group pastors, I talked about what's at stake here. There are five things at stake. Why this needs to come together in an integral way, okay? Because um, I'm, I'm very passionate about evangelism. But the five things, if we do not connect Sunday to Monday, first of all, we're not biblically faithful. I mean, if, if, if I didn't believe what I'm telling you, you know, and I don't have perfect knowledge, is what the scripture teaches. I wouldn't be here, okay? I mean, I, I'm still learning, I'm learning, I'm open to correction, I've done a lot of work in this area, and that's why I had to shift, because I wasn't being faithful to what the scripture taught. I believe that in my life, and my paradigm of pastoral vocation was impoverished because of it, so I'm just, that's my experience, but I'm not alone. There's just so many that are beginning to say, the Lord's doing, the Spirit's doing something here to get us a little bit more, not balanced or more focused. It's not either or. So I would say five things real quick are at stake. That's why I'm so passionate about it. First, the worship of God is at stake. Because if people do not understand that every moment of their day, every relationship, everything they do is to be an act of worship to God, then what God deserves is not getting done. If people have a really compartmentalized life, compartmentalized life then the worship of God is at stake. That's what I'm so passionate about. Secondly, spiritual formation of God's people are at stake. I'm deeply committed to spiritual formation and the, and the spiritual disciplines. But spiritual formation is designed to be in the majority of our life and what we do in the work. Work itself is formative. Suffering in the workplace is formative. The Holy Spirit's empowerment in the workplace. So I'm saying work is a primary spiritual formation reality. And many of us have not, me, I'll say me, have never taught that. We have Bible studies which are good. We have prayer, fasting. I'm all that. We're deeply committed to that. But many people cannot connect that to their workplace. Their work is primarily utilitarian and just getting a paycheck. It is a primary place where the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light merge, and it's a primary means of formation. So if we are not equipping people for the workplace, we are not forming them in Christ likeness fully. So it's a spiritual formation issue. Third thing, it's a plausibility issue. The plausibility of the gospel is at stake here because we could go on and on about what, it's, what faith is like in the late modern world. The world in which we live, the gospel is increasingly nonsensical. 
okay? Just as, as an intelligent person for a lot of cultural reasons. So the workplace is the primary intersection where Christians intersect with other people of other worldviews, right? And so much of the gospel has to be, it's like first century, has to be seen, I could say before, or as it is heard. I mean, I'm going to sequence it. But it's not just hearing the gospel, it's seeing it lived out and made plausible. That's the incarnation. And the vast majority of people will never enter a church or even a parachurch Bible study, right? That we're to reach, our mission. So, I, you know, Chan and Platt, I have a little bit of difference of Platt in terms of sort of the, the, the simple life thing on economics, but, but I don't disagree at all. So the plausible of the gospel, the, third, the fourth thing is the proclamation of the gospel. They go together. If people are not equipped to worship, to grow, to live, to honor God in their work, which they do a majority of their life, then if they're not equipped to proclaim the gospel in a, in a way of life in their workplace, they're missing out massively on evangelism. Right? And I say the primary work of the church is the church at work. I believe that, missiologically. And then lastly, the common good's at stake. The scripture teaches deeply about how we're to serve the common good. And work is a fundamental way where the common good of all image bearers see the goodness of co common grace. So I mean, we could go seven or eight things, but I'm saying that's why it's not an either or, but I would suggest to my friends, and you know, my wife and I support crew staff, and uh, we're not, I mean, I, I love crew, uh, but I do think the local church is at the heart of it all, okay? Theologically, missiologically, sociologically. We can't sidestep the local church as much as she can frustrate us. But I do think this is a more biblically faithful, integral, and it, what it does, on the top here, it connects what it should. It connects the cultural mandate, the great commandment, and the great commission in a seamless way. You can't just pull one out of the other. All, all three of those are vital for the whole story of Scripture. So we can talk more, but uh, I, don't, I think it's really important, and it's not an either or, it's a, it's a, it's a both end of integration. We're going to do one oh, more question. Okay. One more that was a really important yeah. question. I was already going to take too long. And uh, for those of you that have questions that we did not get to, we will be doing another Q&A okay. at the next session. So, awesome. Thank great. you for the good question. I, uh, I think this is a great topic to be diving into. Um, it's something that I've struggled with for a while. Um, yeah. I think one thing that I see as a danger point is the bias that we kind of all have when we look at certain things, for example, I studied marketing in college and one of my buddies who I was going through a discipleship program with said, how do you justify going into a career where you're just kind of going to try to sell people stuff that they don't need? Um, and I think, you know, when you look at it and you say a job is your compensation, work something different, I think there's a little bit of danger there. Um, and our examples that we're looking at are a heart surgeon and an architect mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. people who design life-saving devices, and those are pretty easy. But when you have somebody that is an Uber driver right. or trying to fag figure out their place in life, how do you make your message consistent for them? Yeah. And that's a really good question. I gave you two examples because that's two of the people I work close with, but it's absolutely right. In the faith and work movement, there's a lot of conversation on the importance of dealing with all aspects of work, paid and non-paid. So I couldn't agree with you more. I just highlighted a couple. Um, and I think, again, Wherever people are in their workplace, they need to have a hopeful realism. This is what I would use. That work is always a mixed bag of the good, bad, and ugly. It's where the kingdom of darkness and kingdom of light mingle. So we're not commu communicating any kind of utopian dynamic that work is hard, but it is also formative. Because in the biblical worldview, suffering is not senseless. Difficulty is not senseless. The, the difficulty in relationships and so forth are vital for formation. Another aspect you're talking about is economics, and that's a whole other book we're just finishing. But economics, the Christian church, if you want to read, I think, the best scholar in this area, because if you go back to the early church, Peter Brown, who was at Princeton, wrote a book called Through the Eye of a Needle. He's a former, the best, New Test or best early church scholar in America. And he traces two themes of wealth, how we see money in the church. And there are two big themes. Uh, the Pelagian view is that wealth uh, and ties to your marketing point about flourishing, that people make things that people don't need. But... One side of the church through Augustine, one through Pelagian, okay? And today you have Schneider, the good of affluence, you have Ron Sider. Very different views of wealth and money and economy, okay? Peter Brown articulates the history of this divergence between wealth, wealth economy, marketing, stuff as intrinsically evil and wrong and unspiritual, okay? Some of the simple church, radical Christian living moves in more that theme, okay? Two very divergent themes. The other is to see wealth as a good gift from God. It has to be stewarded well. It can corrupt you, but it's not intrinsically wrong. It's part of creation. So I'm saying, I think just to study, I don't know, are you a pastor or in a, or in a corporate world? or Yeah, 
So if you want a really good read as a thoughtful congregant, Peter Brown's book is very thick, but it's brilliant. And it's through the eye of the needle and how the churches wrestle with wealth and material things throughout history. And it would, it would be just worth your time to wade into it. It's called Through Eye of a Needle, Peter Brown. Best work ever done on that. And, and we all wrestle with money, wealth, materialism, what's enough, how much, how does it fit in as a Christian? And there are tensions about that, right? I hold to an Augustine view um, that wealth itself is a gift from God, but it can be corrupted. Obviously, like power, it has to be handled very carefully for the good of God. But other people see it as intrinsically unspiritual and wrong, and you need to get rid of it. No, I don't mean that in a pejorative way. There's, there's different streams of thought that have just different expressions. Okay? Yeah, sorry. I don't know if we took too long here, so yeah, thank you. Uh, let's give uh, Tom a hand. That was fantastic. Uh, so my name is Brian Bademan, and I'm the director of McLaren CSF, um, which is a name that I hope you will soon forget, because I think in just over two weeks, uh, we're changing our name. Uh, so if you know McLaren CSF, uh, uh, you can find out about uh, that name change at our coming benefit on uh, September 30th. Uh, but we are uh, very proud sponsors of um, these kinds of conversations in the Twin Cities, uh, huge fans of the Work With Purpose initiative here at Bethel, uh, fans of the kinds of questions that Thrivent is asking of their members, uh, uh, fans of the Made to Flourish network, and um, conversations like this that are happening all over the the country and indeed world. Um, we consider ourselves a very sort of humble corner of that uh, movement, that work with purpose movement or the faith at work movement. We're sort of the collegiate arm of that at the University of Minnesota. So we're trying to take these uh, very ideas to students, graduate students, and faculty uh, at uh, in, in our region, at least, one of the most important uh, institutions uh, uh, here. Um, if you're interested in knowing a little bit more about our work, uh, we have uh, reading groups, uh, we have a fellows program. Actually, we have two fellows here, uh, I realized. Um, Caitlin there and Davis over here. So if, if you want a fellows perspective, you can uh, talk to them. Uh, we uh, sponsor lectures um, and, and other kinds of things. Uh, many of our programs are actually open to church people, uh, and so we do invite you all into them. Um, you can find out more uh, back there from my colleague Aaron, um, and, uh, but I'm, I'm here to announce a break. So uh, I think we got about 10 minutes. Uh, have some more food and uh, enjoy uh, one another's fellowship.